the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. And today I am lucky enough to be with Mark Crail. Mark, could you give us a 60 second elevator pitch about who you are and what you write? Sure. Thanks for having me, Allison. Um, my name is Mark Crail, and I'm uh, an old guy, but a new author. Um, I'm in my 70s and just started writing um, because I was getting a little bored during the pandemic, um, and uh, my job at Disney World was uh, Disney World was closed, so I decided to write a book. Um, my first book is called Tales Out of School, published by Sea Hill Press, and um, it chronicles the rookie year of a ele- an elementary school teacher uh, in rural Amish country, Ohio, in 1970. Um, I was a teacher myself and then a principal uh, and longtime school superintendent before I uh, went to work in the education department at Disney. Um, they say always write about what you know about. So I have a four book series called the Tales series. Uh, the first book, as I mentioned, was Tales Out of School, A Rookie Teacher, followed up by uh, more Tales Out of School, same character um, who becomes an elementary school principal. The next book is called Super Tales Out of School, and it's about uh, the same character as a school superintendent. And then I went to work at Disney um, in Animal Kingdom in the Animal Education Department. So the last book is called Wild Tales After School, and uh, or Out of School. And then um, most recently, completely off, uh, unrelated to the first four books. Um, I have a mother-in-law who just turned 100 years old, and I wrote a book, loosely a novel, loosely based on her life, and it's called No Average Joe. So that's a little bit about me, and um, I'm late to the table becoming an author, but once I started, I, I, I got a bug for writing. Well, you and I seem to have some things in common. So in the early 70s, I was not a teacher, but I was a student uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania, which is um, very steeped in Amish history. Uh, right. So I find that kind of fun. <laughs> yep, that's right. And my books are set in Holmes County, Ohio, which is the epicenter of the Amish culture in, in Ohio. But I, I know exactly where you're talking about. And I added that element because um, people like you and I who grew up and, and know about the Amish, um, a lot of other people um, have some vague notion of horses and buggies and and uh, uh, odd clothing and things like that, uh, but people seem to be interested in Amish cu- customs and religious beliefs and so on. So they're they're a big part of the, the book series. So while I grew up sort of Amish adjacent, let's just say, so right next to Lancaster County, um, Pennsylvania, yep. Yep. which most people think of as heartland for Amish. Uh, so are, when you talk about being that it's your principal or a teacher first year, the the first book, which is a teacher. Are you actually working with the Amish? Or are you just working in Amish country? Just working in Amish country. Um, uh, yeah, but I would say probably about 20% of the population in Holmes County, Ohio um, is Amish country. So, you know, you, you, you don't go anywhere without, um, passing buggies and seeing Amish farms and and dealing with Amish uh, business people and and things like that. Uh, But the the character in the book um, teaches in a public school um, that wouldn't include many Amish students, 
most Amish students go to their own uh, Amish schools. Well, this is so fascinating, and I'm I am so much reminded of home in that uh, you know going to the farmers market, for example, every Friday morning with my grandmother, and she would bring her basket, and we would pick out all the fruits and the vegetables and the homemade goods and the homemade uh, meals that we could take home, sort of ready to eat. Uh, fantastic pastas and pies that were always made by the Amish and stories of, you know, how they would get to market. You know, they would, they would have to hitch rides and things in order to be able to get there, um, which was just fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that matches my memories as, as well. Yep. Um, it's a very, it's a much different lifestyle. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting um, f for readers. And, and, and uh, so some of the characters in the book, uh, in the books are Amish, but most are what the Amish would refer to as English, meaning everybody who's not Amish. All right. And so the first three books are all in that same location? Yes. The first, actually, the first four books are all in that location. This character um, um, uh, is from uh, Long Island, New York. He happens to go to college at Kent State University. And uh, you and I are of an age where we remember what happened at Kent State University on May 4th, 1970. And that were that was um, uh, protests that led to the killings of four um, college students. So the university is shut down on account of the um, the shootings and riots and so on. And the character has to go find himself a job, and he ends up in a little town called Walnut Creek, Ohio. Well, I love it. I actually went to college in Ohio too. So, uh, <laughs> but moving right along. Is this, are, are these stories autobiographical? Well, no, I'm not going to say autobiographical, but are they more like memoir? Are they fictional? Are they a combo? Well, they are a combo. Um, the, book, the books are novels, uh, but many of the stories um, either happen to me or f colleagues or friends of mine. Um, and the neat thing about writing fiction is you don't have to stick to the truth and you can embellish and, and uh, uh, use your writer's prerogative to em embellish uh, the stories and so on. Uh, but a lot of them are loosely based on, um, on my uh, career and things that happened to me and my students. I firm belie firmly believe that uh, fiction is not stranger than fact, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. All right. You wrote in some questions that I could ask you, and one of them is that you were undiagnosed dyslexic, which gives us another connection because I did go through school all the way up until before graduate school, but I was an undiagnosed dyslexic, and it has shaded much of my experience with learning. Yes, that's for sure. Um, elementary school um, and, well, all the way up through K-12 were pretty difficult um, for me. Um, I, I'm sure somebody knew about dyslexia then, but not didn't seem to be where I grew up and when I grew up in the 1950s and 60s. And, um, and so I was just always a kid who seemed to be pretty bright, but yet couldn't spell, had difficulty learning to read um, with atrocious handwriting and, and, and so on. Um, most dyslexics, um, you don't outgrow um, it, but you sort of compensate. Um, I could not write a book if I didn't have my Alexa at my side, because in just about every sentence, there's a word I can't spell. Um, so, um, yeah, it made school a little tougher. But I also think that it made me a better elementary school teacher. You know, the really bright kids, it doesn't matter who their teacher is, they're going to learn anyway. 
they have the, all the tools and so on. But for the kids who are more reluctant um, learners or, or have um, difficulties of their own, I got that. And it made me, um, I think, it made help to make me a better, better teacher. I always thought that having dyslexic was the reason I became a great problem solver. If I couldn't think of the word, couldn't find it in the dictionary, so back before spell check, if I couldn't find it in the dictionary, it forced me to find another word. And so I was constantly recreating, rewriting, and it's probably... The single reason I became fascinated with the the act of writing. And while writing a novel, writing a book is very challenging in and of itself because you have to have an idea to start with. You have to see it all the way through completion. Then there's a whole bunch of other steps with publishing. But the challenge of writing itself, finding the right words and then finding the words that are next to because you can't figure out how to spell it, how to find it in the dictionary. I'm sorry, if you can't spell it and you can't, like I couldn't pronounce the words properly either. So then I couldn't find it in the dictionary. Was it an A or an E or an O? I had no clue. And so I just would be like, all right, I'm going to change direction and just pick another word. Yep, yep. And um, I, I, I get you a hundred percent on that. Um, and I, I, I guess by the time I was a young teacher, um, I knew that I struggled with things like spelling and so on. So I would just tell the kids in my class, hey, Mr. Creel doesn't, isn't a very good speller and, and so on. Um, handwriting isn't very good. Um, you know, Susie, could you write that on the board? And, and um, uh, kid, kids, um, uh, kids were helpful. And um, um, I, I guess we we hear stories about someone who is blind, for instance. Uh, but um, to sort of compensate for that, um, they sort of overdevelop their sense of hearing or touch or whatever. And and I think when people are dyslexic, um, we we find workarounds um, to um, you know to to get. Get the get the job done, and I guess it does make you more creative and more of a problem solver. I never thought of that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that idea. Yeah, I have my whole I have I have a speech on that one. <laughs> 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 that that red pen from my elementary through high school days was uh, very significant in my life. So uh, I totally totally appreciate the fact that you were able to understand and empathize with students. I did the same thing as a professor. I would tell people, I'm sorry if I can't pronounce your name and if I get the words wrong, but, you know, please correct me. And I would, I would say a word that I want to put on the board and I would ask them how to spell it. And granted they're college students, but they would still um, get a kick out of me being like, no, 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 it's this way. And then they would all spell it for me. Yep. Yep. And that, um, I think that's helpful as well because when you're open and upfront with people about your um, st struggles and so on, um, they tend to recognize that and they're they're pretty helpful for the most part. Um, and um, and I I always did that throughout my career. Um, my colleagues, my students, the parents of my students. Um, um, their understanding um, was tremendously helpful, and building relationships was very, very important. And, and I think it's those relationships that um, lead to success in, in any endeavor that someone um, is attempting. All right, I'm going to move on to your latest book, which is the No Average Joe that you loosely wrote about your mother-in-law. Is that correct? That's correct. She turned 100 years old uh, on May 4th. Oh, may the 4th be with you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So tell me what it's like to write about your mother-in-law. Well, this was big fun for both of us. Um, she is a storyteller. 
Um, and I'm a storyteller, um, probably more of a storyteller than an author, to be truth be told. Um, but um, she she does not see very well anymore. Uh, but she, her memory is sharp as a tack. So we started out with stories from her childhood, some of which I had heard previously, you know, just from being in a part of her family for nearly 50 years as her, as one of her son-in-laws. But, um, but we would talk on the phone, and one thing would lead to another, and she'd say, have I ever told you the story about... And, and then she she would relay that, and I'd be taking notes and and um, and and putting things um, you know in my memory bank to use. Um, I think um, I think we became a lot closer from all those conversations, um, and um, it, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, I think for both of us. Uh, uh, to to do this, and uh, and again we kept it. It's a novel, um, so I didn't have to strict strictly keep to uh, the, the facts, um, but um, embellished as well. But but I think it turned out pretty well, and um, it's been a, a hit with uh, book clubs in my area and. Uh, and other readers who can kind of relate because it's also, she was born in 1924. So her life story is really the, the history of the last hundred years, starting with the, you know, um, the boom times of the 1920s, the Great Depression of the 1930s, World War II, a time when she got married and went to Germany with her, with her um, GI doctor husband, um, uh, uh, to serve there shortly after the war, um, the, the you know the 50s, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s, and having teenagers in the 1970s, and and just on and on. It's kind of a it's it, it's kind of a history of America over the past hundred years. Well, Mark, you and I, our paths should have crossed because my mom was a child. So let's just say 10, 11, 12 years old. And she lived in post-World War II Germany as well. Oh, my gosh. How about that? <laughs> well, 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 this character was um, born in a tiny little town in West Virginia, Fayetteville, West Virginia. Um, and there were not many opportunities, career paths or anything, um, for young girls, especially a hundred years ago, and especially during a Great Depression, and especially in a tiny coal mining uh, community, um, but she sort of bucked the odds and chose her own path. She became a pilot, um, and and had these adventures, uh, uh, including Germany and and, and so on. Um, she had seven children, six surviving, um, and um, uh, it, it's a big, raucous family. Um, and, uh, um, you know, some people don't like their mother-in-laws much, but I got the greatest one, and, and it, was, it was a great project for, for both of us. We had good laughs, and um, it, was, it was a great time together. And she's even accompanied me at some of my presentations at book clubs and and things like that. And she has a blast doing that. She's kind of a ham. Well, Mark, this has been such a fun conversation. How can people learn more about you and your books? Well, my publisher is Seahill Press out of Leesburg, Florida. Um, my website is www.crailtales.com. And Crail is spelled C-R-A-I-L and then Tales, T-A-L-E-S. Um, that's the website the, that they could order the uh, books and, and so on, and, and also get in touch with me if they need, uh, if they need to. Um, I, I've been having a blast um, um, talking, with, uh, talking with people and comparing stories just like you and I have today, um, and um, 
I would I would welcome any, anybody uh, who wanted to get in touch and and talk or compare notes or whatever. That would be fun. That's fantastic. Well, Mark, are you ready to switch to our rapid fire questions? I'm ready. What is your favorite meal to eat? Oh, I have an Italian daughter-in-law. I mean, not Italian-American, an Italian daughter-in-law. And her pasta dishes are unbeatable. Um, So anything my daughter-in-law, Elisabetta, cooks would be my favorite meal of the day. And do you have a dream car that you'd like to consider someday? Oh, I'm a car guy and always have have been. I've had a a series of of fun cars, little convertibles, uh, an old Triumph, uh, uh, Toyota MR2. Um, So I, I like cars. And my wife hates uh, it, but I get a, I, I change cars as often as some people change socks. So um, right now I'm, I'd like to go electric, so some sort of a, of a plug-in car would, would definitely be my next car. You've asked me a good question there. I love cars. And if you were to glance outside your window right now, what type of weather do you have? Well, I live in Central Florida, and it is early June, so it's going to be another hot day. Hopefully, we'll get a little rain in the afternoon. It's sunshiny, and um, we love living in Florida for the weather, but June, July, and August are maybe not our favorite months to be here. Um, People up north go south in the winter to enjoy um, some warmth, and we plan vacations in the summer to get out of Dodge and go somewhere a little bit cooler. Well, Mark Crail, thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thank you, Allison. I appreciate it very much. It was great to talk with you. You have been listening to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison out. We're all done. Okay. Thank you so much. That was fun. We do have a lot of connections. Mark Crail believes that it is far better to be lucky than good. And because of that, he claims to be the luckiest man in the world. Professionally, Mark struggled with dyslexia, but with the help of persistence, he became a successful teacher, principal, and superintendent. That success came about with a great deal of help from family, friends, colleagues, and students. He was able to earn a doctorate in educational administration because he likes to say, He just kept showing up. Tales Out of School is Mark's first novel. Mark and his wife, Jane, have been married for over 45 years. They have two sons, two daughter-in-laws, and two granddaughters. Discover more at seahillpress.com. For more information about the Florida Writers Association, visit us at floridawriters.org. Until next time.